Hi everyone, I'm Yuta Marta coming here today. I bought my first in the first row. I did my best, I bought something else, but not enough. Sorry for that. So, I would like to start this talk with a brief exercise. Please raise your hand in, in, the, in the past few minutes, some of you have been reading the slides that were running. Nobody? Come on, raise your hands. Okay, some of you. Now, raise your hand, those of you that, while running those slides, were able to come up with at least one name of a person they might know, whether it is in their work environment or maybe even their personal life. Nice, nice. See some honesty here. That's actually very great. And it doesn't surprise me at all, because according to the statistics, around 6% of the population suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, which is a severe psychopathology, which is characterized by the presence of at least five of the following nine criteria. Let's see them. First of all, a grandiose sense of self-importance, a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. A belief that he or she is special and unique. A need for excessive admiration. A sense of entitlement. Interpersonally exploitive behavior. Lack of empathy. Envy of others. Or the belief that others are envious of them. And finally, a demonstration of arrogant or haughty behaviors or attitudes. Does this sound a bit familiar to you? So, if we consider that the current world population counts 7.6 billion people, the 6% of that makes a staggering 420 million people. And this number only accounts for the people who have actually been diagnosed with the disorder which are very, very small percentage of the people who are actually suffering from it. This is because the disorder itself is characterized by an inherent set of perfection, so that the people who are suffering from it never go to therapy and never get diagnosed. Not only in addiction to this, we must say that the narcissism works on a very wide spectrum, and that one doesn't necessarily need to be diagnosed or even have many of these criteria in order to show many narcissistic traits and therefore be a serious threat to the well-being of others. For example, we can talk about all the other personality disorders of the cluster B, which are borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. All of these personality disorders from the cluster B show many of the patterns, characteristics, and behaviors of narcissistic personality disorder, and they can be very challenging. Now, it is very, very difficult to make a serious calculation of how many people suffer from these, but according to the statistics right now, we, this counts for 15% of the world population, which translates into one into seven people. Now I see you looking around yourself. Yeah, one into seven people. Let me take one moment here. This means that one into seven people suffers from a severe emotional disorder that makes them inherently more inclined to abuse, manipulate, and exploit others. Now, before I move on, I want to stop and make a huge, huge, very pink disclaimer here. With this talk, I do not intend to discriminate anyone with a personality disorder. I myself am a fierce defender that mental health should never, ever be a reason to discriminate, nor much less to stigmatize people. And it is absolutely true that the world is full of examples of people who have recovered from these disorders with a lot of therapy, self-care, willpower, and personal effort. But it is also true that a huge amount of people suffering from narcissistic personality disorder never get diagnosed and therefore never get well. And as much as I really do believe that these people do not deserve to be stigmatized, I know that the world is full of potential victims, and I also do believe that all of those also do not deserve to be victimized. I myself 
have been abused by a narcissist for a long time. And uh, I'm a survivor, and I know how much pain these people can put another human being through. And this is why I'm here today, to talk about this very important issue which is touching each one of us. I'm here to speak about this, to warn you about this threat, to help any of you who might be suffering in silence. And of course, the ultimate purpose here is to help each one of you as an activist and all the organizations who are here today to protect themselves from this, in order to be able to do what we are supposed to be doing, which is save animals. And it is very important that we all understand that the third sector, the non-profit sector, is particularly exposed to this threat. In fact, narcissists really have a fertile soil in order to get what they want, which is admiration, respect, recognition, building their careers behind the mask of altruism and social functions that can very easily get what they want and need the most. Power and control. So before I move on, and you're all scared now, let's have a look at what this threat really, really looks like. Workplace disruptions brought on by a narcissist, they work as a hidden cancer that can literally destroy an organization from within. Just one disordered individual within an organization can cause enormous trouble, creating situations like inefficient management, harassment, absenteeism, excessive litigation, job-related stress, lower efficiency, and power abuse. Not only this, just one single disorder individual can cause organizations to waste huge amounts of time trying to solve litigations coming from problems that are arised by these people, or even even worse, ancient amounts of money spent in court trying to solve all the problems that these people cause organizations. So this is why I think that it's really, really important that we all are aware of this threat and learn how to identify it. And according to this, it must be said that as much as it is very important, identifying narcissistic personality disorder individuals is not an easy challenge at all for anyone who has never digged deep enough into the pathology to know how to do that. And this is why I'm here today. I'm going to try to help you to learn some methods that can help you to identify if you're dealing with somebody who is toxic in your organization. But first and foremost, know that there is one thing that you all have already, which constitutes for you a way that can tell you with almost 100% of certainty if you are dealing with somebody who is disordered, and this is your gut feelings. So now, do you remember the person that you could come up at the very beginning of my talk, that person that shows some of the behaviors that we have been seeing? If you think about that relationship, you might realize that you have indeed had some feelings, some weird feelings about this person from the very beginning of the relationship. But you were never really aware of this until the moment you find yourself completely upset and angry and also feeling physically sick about this relationship. Does this sound familiar? I see many people saying yes, and it is exactly the way it should be. I mean, this is exactly the way it works. When we are dealing with somebody on the spectrum of narcissism, this is exactly the, the way it goes. We start having these feelings about the relationship and they get worse over a period of time and specifically across four different stages. So now I'm going to show you all the stages and I'm going to tell you the feelings that accompany these stages so that you can understand if you're dealing with somebody who is on the spectrum. The first phase is the phase of attraction. This phase says it all. This phase is meant for the narcissist to make you like them. And they will do they will do whatever it takes to obtain this. They will really go to great lengths because their intention right now is to lower your defenses so that you gain their, uh, they gain your trust. And in order to obtain this, they will use a variety of psychological techniques. The most common are 
they flatter you, which means they praise you a lot. They tell you how amazing you are, how incredible you are, how happy they are that you're on the team. Wow, you're so intelligent, you're so smart. I admire you so much. They give you a lot of attention. They really definitely stay a lot of time speaking to you. They show you a lot of friendship. They try to gain complicity with you. And as a result of all of this, you feel absolutely amazing. This is like ecstasy. You feel perfect. Every time you are around this person, you feel absolutely self-confident. You're so happy in your job. You feel like you can do everyone, everything you want. This is the mechanism. But then we very fastly go to stage number two, which is the stage of discomfort. In this stage, you can start seeing some of the very first red flags of this relationship. Of course, you see that uh, the person is slowly giving you less and less attention. The same person that at some point will listen to you talk for hours now is just maybe interrupting you or something where is going on. You cannot really get a grip on it. You feel irritated at some point. But the most important part of this phase is that you tend to suppress all of the feelings that you're feeling weird about this relationship. So you, you know that something wrong, but you have the tendency to say, it's just me. It's just me, and uh, there must be something wrong about me. This is because they have been so good in the first phase that they have been able to convince you that they are that charming and lovely person you met in the first phase. And according to because of that work that they did, you are now very not likely to give in to the idea that they might not be that person. And then we go to the third stage, which is the stage of frustration. In this stage is where all your feelings about this relationship and about this person get into sharper focus. You can no longer deny your comfort and unpleasant feelings about this relationship. And you feel yourself way more uneasy all the time. The situation is really getting worse. You start feeling a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-criticism starts in your mind. And one very important aspect of this phase is that you really would like to go back to the first phase and you do really work hard to go back to the first phase. So you work in a way that you, all you want is to just feel great again with this person about your job and what, about your, what you're doing, but you shortly understand that no matter how much effort you put in this, no matter how much you try, it just doesn't work. So you are extremely confused because you think, I must have done something really bad if this person that used to like me so much now is insulting me, belittling me, and so on. So the main key aspect of this phase is that you experience a huge erosion of self-confidence. Then there is the first stage, which is the stage of attack or avoidance. And it is called like this because you can go either in one or the other direction, most likely depending on your personality type. In this stage is where you feel the most unpleasant feelings. You literally cannot stand this person anymore. You find yourself obsessing about this person, of course, in a negative way. And these feelings, they never let you. So you don't only feel uncomfortable when you are around this person, but also when you go home, you're supposed to be in your free time, and you're st still thinking about this job, and this thing, and this person, and all you can do is think about this. You might also start having some physical ailments. Normally, it's a headache or a, uh, an upside stomach that you cannot complain. There are also many studies who show that, for example, a weird back pain that appears from one day to the other might be an indicator that you are dealing with a narcissist. And the key aspect of this phase is that you start having fantasies. Fantasies about getting rid of this person. And you can fantasize about the person to be either moved of the department, to leave the organization, or maybe even to get fired. But even worse, you might find yourself starting to fantasize about you leaving your job. Maybe you've been in this movement for a while and you love what you do, but you're so upset and you cannot take it anymore to the point that you're really open to the idea of leaving. 
Now, we have seen how these stages work, and uh, it is important to know that the period of time that one stage can last, it's very dependent on the kind of relationship that you have with this person. If this person is somebody you have need to have contact with every day at the office, it, be, it might be faster, otherwise it can take a bit longer. So there isn't really a rule, just say, pay attention. The most important thing here is to understand that all of these phases, they do not happen on a linear progression, but they are cyclical. So in this diagram, I have done my very best to draw for you the way it more or less works. So in the outer part of a circle, in pink, you see the three phases that constitute every single narcissistic relationship ever, whether it is a romantic relationship, a friendship, a relationship with a parent or a family member, or a work relationship. These three phases are the idealization, the devaluation, and the discard. And in the inner, the inner circle, the gray one, you see how the phases that I have been talking to you about fall under these three areas. So you will see that the idealization phase and the attraction phase almost are the same, then between the devaluation and the discard, we will have stage second and stage third. And here is where the tension in the relationship is building up. Until the moment the discard happens. And he is, here is normally, maybe for example, a big fight with your colleague or your boss, something that really goes away, out of control, and uh, makes it very difficult to interact with this person for even a period of time, maybe. But, the most important thing to know is that after this discard will come another idealization phase, which means that the person will come to you and apologize, I'm so sorry for what I did, I feel ashamed for what I did, I promise you this will never happen again, I appreciate you so much. And of course, you feel amazing again, because wow, this person must be honest, and they had this very genuine face in their, yeah, eyes in their face, so I must believe them and feel great again. And the cycle of abuse is repeated. Now, in romantic relationship, it has been studied that this cycle can go over on average seven times. In working relationship, it's very, very much dependent on the kind of working relationship that you have with the person, but in general, it is very important that you are mindful of the fact that this is cyclical, and unless the person is generally interested in doing something to change the behavior, the cycle will happen again. Now we have learned how to identify our feelings in relation to narcissistic personality disorder individuals, but there is another way that you can use to try to understand if you're actually dealing with a toxic person, and it is to understand their manipulation techniques. In fact, again, what they need and want the most is to obtain power and control over others. And in order to do so, they use a variety of psychological techniques that help them in this purpose. Now I'm going to show you a bit of them, not all of them, because of course there are many, but the ones I think are more important for you to know, so that hopefully next time you're going to see one, you're going to know it. The first one is shaming. Shaming can be described as the act of belittling someone with the purpose of damaging their self-esteem. Narcissists use this tactic all the time just because they love and enjoy pleasure from making other people feel bad about themselves, making them feel stupid, weak, or simply less than themselves because they need this. So a very example of this might be a colleague that comes to your office and either drops a quite unpleasant comment about the way you look the day, or maybe something like, hey, I have read your notes for the meeting. Guess you didn't have much time to prepare them, huh? Something like that. Very, very subtle. Subtle enough to make sure they will get away and do not have any responsibility over their abuse. Another very important tactic that I really like to talk to you about is lying. And we could have another entire talk about this. Lying is the one single most effective way people can either get something, get away with something, or hide something. Three things a narcissist use and need at all times. Narcissists are masters of liars. They have learned the fine art of using words to manipulate and fool people, so you really need to be very, very careful with the lies. 
they can lie readily, easily, and about anything, even the most important thing. This is why, well, some say narcissists have no conscience. I will say they have a severely impaired conscience, but the result is the same. They have no integrity, but they do lie under the assumption that you do have one, and this is their game because they expect you to never be able to really understand that they're lying about something so important, right? This is their game, so be careful. An example of this might be, imagine you have been working within an organization for a while and you have been asking for a raise for a few times, right? Now you ask your boss for a meeting, you sit in the, in the meeting room and you will say, well, what about my raise? And they will be like, Wow, thank you so much for raising this issue now. Of course, of course you're gonna get your raise. I've been working on these, trust me, you have my word. I will really take care of this. It's just, I've been very busy, but don't worry. Of course, I appreciate you so much. And I want you to get what you actually need and I think you deserve. You get out of the meeting, you are so happy, finally you're gonna get what you asked for and what you were promised, only shortly later to realize that they never followed through. So this is an overt and open lie straight into your face with no remorse. Another one is feigning innocence. Feigning innocence is a tactic that is used by the narcissist when they want to make you believe that the harm they caused was unintentional or that, that it just didn't happen. It can be as subtle as a look of surprise or even indignation when they are confronted with the abuse they have been consuming against you. An example of this might be, imagine you're working on a project you really love. In a, in a period of your life in which you have so many other tasks, you feel a bit overwhelmed. And there is this other colleague who actually also would like to work on the same project. So one day you are at the coffee break and you just slightly be open up saying, wow, like, I am loving this, but I wish it would have happened in another moment because I have so much on my shoulders right now, and that's it. The day after, you go to the office and your boss calls you in and tells you the project has been assigned to this other person. Weird. So you go to the person and you feel, I don't know, confused or upset and you confront them and they will be like, wow, really lucky and really, I just wanted to do something for you. You look so tired, you, you look like you really needed some help, so I just happened to talk with the boss and I proposed myself for the project. This is feigning innocence. Of course, the person knows they have been stealing the project that you wanted to work on, but they want to get away and not have responsibility on that. Brandishing anger. Brandishing anger consists in an overt, deliberate and calculated display of anger used as a tool of coercion and intimidation. When using this tool, narcissists are not angry at all. They're just faking it. All they want is to put in place a sufficient amount of emotional intensity to shock somebody into submission and therefore get what they want, which is power and control. And finally, gaslighting. This is one of my favorites. And definitely one of the most sinister, if not the most sinister, of all the manipulation techniques that can be used by narcissists. The name uh, comes from a um, thriller movie from the 1930, in which a Kanavik husband was trying to get rid of his wife by convincing her she was going insane and she belonged to a sanitary. And the way he would be doing this was by manipulating her environment and then letting her believe she was the only one saying this. This is kind of freaking scary, right? Well, narcissists do this all the time. So, so far, we have seen some of the ways we can use our feelings to identify narcissists. We have learned to recognize some of the manipulation techniques and in this next session, I'm going to show you some of the behaviors that narcissists display in the work environment, whether they are your manager, your peer, or your subordinate. Now, before I move on, another disclaimer here. None of the behaviors I'm going to show in isolation 
means that you have to be alarmed. We are all humans here, and it's completely normal and natural that at some point in our life we behave in a way that is not professional or not ethical even. That's fine. Yet, if you find out that one of the persons you're working with show this behavior on a regular pattern over a period of time and maybe even across a variety of situations, then it's very likely that you're dealing with somebody on the spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder and you should be careful. Let's start from the narcissistic boss. First of all, let me say that narcissists tend to see themselves as leaders and it's very not uncommon to see them holding positions of power within organizations. I don't need to say this, the world is full of examples of people who are lumping narcissists holding positions of power, let's see for example in politics, right? Now, one could think that if somebody got it to the top, it must have been because of their talent, their skills, their ability and their hard work and commitment. And of course, this is most of the times true, but not always. And this will be the case of the people who have made it to the top by years of manipulating, distorting reality, stealing credit, and hiding their self truth So, one, most, one very important thing is, is to understand that we have the power to change this, and I'm going to explain you later how to do this. Let's have a look at, um, at somebody, uh, something that is very important, which is the concept of executive narcissism. The concept uh, means that one person might get an inflated sense of self-confidence and self-entitlement that arises as a result of raising higher within a hierarchy in the organizational setting and therefore having less supervision. And as we will see later, this is extremely dangerous in the organization. Now let's have a look at some of the behaviors that a nar narcissistic boss will show. They do not respect employees' time, which means that they cancel meetings at the very last moment, they not, don't show up for meetings that were scheduled, or they make people work in the free time without asking them for permission or just giving it for granted. They take credit for employees' work and ideas. They do not compliment employees, it's like they don't really care. They, it's, it's like it costs them some for, for work to do that. They do not seem to be generally interested in employees in their personal lives or so on, but they can fake it. They are very critical and they tend to be very difficult to satisfy. They give confusing instructions to the point that you find yourself saying, what do you want from me? They lack empathy, but again, they can really, really very well fake it. And they do not respect employees' needs. Now, narcissists in positions of power, as I said before, constitute a serious threat for the well-being of, of course, activists, but also the organization as a whole. In fact, this kind of pattern normally permeates from executive levels on down, affecting therefore executives, directors, upper managers, middle managers, to every single person within the organization, to the detriment of everything. Now, if after an attentive analysis over a period of time, you have realized that you might be dealing with a narcissistic boss, there's something you can do. First of all, you're only halfway, because the most important thing is to understand that you will not be able to change the person, and that the only person within the relationship that you can change is yourself. But apart from that, there are a few more things that you can do. Of course, there are many, many strategies, and I can give you some books that you can read from, but here I made a collection of my favorites. On this side, you will be reading for some active strategies, and on the other side, for some passive. Again, I will suggest that you use either these or those, depending on your specific situation, and also depending on your personality type, so that you do what you feel most comfortable doing. Let's start with the first one, which is my favorite one in absolute, which is expose them. Narcissists can do all they do only because people around them let them do that. So when we understand this, we understand that we have the power to expose them. So if you work in an environment that is healthy enough to, or strive to be healthy, you will most likely have processes and policies in place that will help you to show concern for some specific relationship within your work organization. My suggestion is that you 
take some courage and just expose them. If you can, go to the human resources department and tell them about your reality, which is, by the way, maybe the reality of all of your colleagues. Or even more, go to their boss, to your boss's head, if that's possible. Now, it is very important to understand that while you're doing this, depending on the degree of the narcissism of your boss, you might be in trouble, and of course, retaliation is around the corner. So be very careful, and most of all, be extremely smart. Because remember, all they want is to hide the truth from everywhere, and they're working really, really hard to make sure nobody understands who they really are, their lack of courage, their inability to lead, and the fact that they've been lying and manipulating people to get to the top for a long time. So most likely, your boss has been manipulated. I mean, their boss's boss has been manipulated for a long time as well. This is why it is extremely important that as much as you can, you collect proofs of the abusive behaviors. And good luck. Second thing you can do is to change your expectations. Of course, this will not change the situation at all, but Really, this can help. In fact, the sooner you realize and embrace the fact that all the abuse and all the manipulation has nothing to do with you, but only is a consequence of the disorder, the sooner you will feel what you will feel the freedom that it comes with realizing that there's nothing you can do to change this. So just change your expectations about this person, about this relationship, accept that you will never change them, and just take some emotional distance from your job if that's needed. On the side of the passive um, strategies, I will say try to avoid them as much as you can. Of course, in some cases that will be not possible, but if you can, try to practice it. So avoid the people at lunch, avoid the people at the coffee break, try to not sit next to them during meetings, try to not have conversations with them, try to keep everything in written, and uh, if you can, avoid business travels with them. Do, like, try to put yourself in a situation where you are not going to be abused. And of course, if you have tried all of these, or even many other things that you might have tried and nothing changes, my heartfelt suggestion is that you just leave the organization you're working for, because you're certainly not, certainly not working in a healthy environment. And the best you can do is just move on. Now, let's move into some of the characteristics of the narcissistic co-worker, the peer, so the, the colleague, somebody who is not on you, or above you, or either below you. Let's, um, let's see what they do. They like to speak behind colleagues' back. Love it. Gossip is their one, more, one most important thing. They love to flatter superiors or peers, but never people below them, but mostly superiors. They love to promote themselves at the expenses of others, of course. And they very often ask, or even I would say expect favors from others. Working with a narcissistic co-working can be a very challenging and difficult situation that can bring to a lot of emotional distress, to the point that one can find himself drained into having to use all of their energies, mental and physical, to try to control the consequence of the negative behavior, of the abusive behavior, instead of just being doing what we're supposed to do, which is save animals. So, here as well, the most important thing, the one most effective thing you can do is to change your expectations, accept the fact that you're not going to change this person, and assume that this person is most likely going to mislead you, cheat on you, and backstab you whenever they can. So the golden rule here would be do not trust them. Besides that, there are some things you can also do. For example, you can set healthy boundaries, both physical and emotional. As for physical, I mean, lock all your stuff. Make sure your colleague doesn't have access to your documents as much as possible. Change your password and try to, yeah, just keep your stuff together. Also, your, the projects you're working on, let them know the minimum, the bare minimum they need. And as for emotional boundaries, I mean, keep your things for yourself. Do not open up about your personal life, your, your doubts, your insecurities, just because they're going to use them against you sometime. So do that. And as for the passive strategies, I will suggest, this is, I think, the most effective and most easy strategy to use, which is withdraw attention. Narcissists, they leave and need attention like, you know, like, like breathing, like air. 
So the moment they will understand that you are not a reliable source of that, they will most likely let you alone. An example of this would be like, imagine their narcissist colleague comes to you and tells you, wow, well, you know, <laughs> I got a raise. They, all, all they want is for you to have a strong reaction to that or whatever, and you'll be like, that's great. They will hate it. And the more you practice this, the more you will see that the person will just slowly lose interest in you. So the idea is that you try to not give them any emotion because all they want is drama, chaos. You don't give them, and they leave. Now let's have a look at the narcissistic subordinate, because one might think that having a narcissistic boss might be the most awful thing that can happen to you in the workplace. In certain ways, yes, but you never underestimate the negative consequences of having somebody on a narcissistic spectrum below you. Let's have a look at the, uh, some of the typical behavior of these people. They try to be seen with you very often. They often try to be favors to you, try to be nice to you if you're the boss, of course. They try to get to flutter or to approve them. They inflate tasks and they inflate accomplishments. They flutter you and they flutter others in higher stages. They need to be blameless to you. They can't stand the fact that you can find them faulty or something. They very easily tend to demand special treatment. And overall, what they do is just they suck your energy. You will notice that you will spend a lot of time dealing with this person and trying to solve their conflicts. They do all of this. One important thing is to understand that uh, identifying a narcissistic subordinate is not easy because they tend to make great first impressions and they, to, and they tend to put, your, put themselves in your mind as great in the first place. So be very careful with that. Now, in this case, I've decided to put strategies in this, in this way for middle managers and for upper managers. So if you are a middle manager and you think you might be dealing with a narcissistic subordinate, there are things you can do. The first one I will suggest is to report it to your manager. Of course, in a very professional way. There's nothing you have to add with, but just let them know. Just because, remember, that this person is going to try to backstab you at some point. So it's better if your manager is aware of the situation. In that case, both of you can work together and make it work, find solutions to try to limit the, the, the problem. And second, pay attention to your bias. This is extremely important because, again, narcissists are great at charming people, very great at charming people. So in, especially in the first phase of the hiring process or the probation period, they will do whatever is in their hands to make sure you feel about them, that they're the best candidate you could have. And then you, so they lower your defenses and you're not able to see the red flags until the moment you have somebody in the team that you wish you wouldn't have and it's too late. So pay attention to your bias and in this case my very first, my very best suggestion is that you judge people on the basis of the facts. Letting, letting out your emotion or your feelings about this person. I think this is the fairest thing you can do and also the safest thing you can do for your organization. Now let's see, if you are an upper manager, which means somebody who is not in direct contact with this person, what can you do in general to make sure you're doing the best you can to avoid this problem? First of all, really, the most important thing you can do is to get educated about this problem. Once you know that this threat exists, you are aware of the fact that all of your employees might be suffering in silence and you should really do whatever is in your hands to avoid this problem, to thrive within your organization. Second of all, listen to your employee very carefully. And this is extremely important. I want to take a moment here because you remember what I said before of narcissists building their roles upon years of lying, manipulating and abusing. I mean, people stay married for 15 years and have children with narcissists and only then understand who they're dealing with. So you might be, you might have been in touch with this person for a long time and you might have given them all their trust, all your trust, but it's not enough. So whenever somebody comes to you and has to report to you, the one most important thing you can do is to give them the benefit of the doubt. Then of course, something else you can do is to immediately block unhealthy behaviors within your organization and 
Most importantly, even, is to model healthy behaviors yourself, which means be the example within your office, within your organization. Try to put healthy boundaries yourself. Treat everyone with respect and at the same time, and live with integrity. I'm almost finishing. I just want to briefly talk about some of the strategies, best practices that organizations can use in order to prevent, not prevent, but minimize this problem. So first of all, of course, try to manage our personal list if you can. Secondly, organizations should have policies in place that would include that whatever kind of abuse will not be tolerated. Not only, these policies should also be enforced at all times. Another very important thing that organizations should do is to provide all employees with a safe space to communicate their problems and concerns. And this may be my favorite one and the most effective. Organizations should implement systems for making every single person with that organization accountable. This is an especially effective way to prevent executive narcissists and translates into everyone within our organization having the exact same roles, from notifying when they are out of the office and why, and ensuring absolute transparency about expenses, and so on. Now, after all of this, I'm sure some of you at least must have talked at some point, what if I am the narcissist in my workplace? Well, if you have been asking yourself this question, I have very great news for you. You're definitely not. <laughs> Nevertheless, I would like to say that indeed, besides being careful with the narcissists around us, we should also learn to pay a lot of attention to our own. In our work, we are already exposed to such a devastating amount of abuse that the least thing you can do is to try to not perpetrate them on each other. So I encourage you to make a daily, constant, and honest exercise of humility and kindness. I encourage you all to look at the ones who are on top of you as people who have more experience and to be willing to learn from them with modesty and consideration. I want to encourage you to look at your peers as people who are doing the very best they can in their position and to try to be as supportive as you can. And I encourage you all to look at the ones below you with respect, with integrity, always remembering that being in a higher position doesn't mean that you have more power, but more responsibility. And finally, I want to encourage you all to stay grounded and to never forget what we're here for. The tens of billions of animals are being raised and killed every year and that we are the only hope. That they're there, suffering in silence and that we have no time to be wasted. So, whatever our title is, the prestige of the organization we're working for the position we are in, not of all matters, not even all of the accomplishments you have achieved during your life within this movement, because this movement is not, and will never be, about us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you.